Joining me now is uh, Stuart Maxwell, and he is the convener of the Education and Culture Committee. Hello. Good morning. And MSP, I should say. Yeah, indeed, yes, since right. 2003. Tell us about the committee then. What, what, what is it you're involved with with that? Well, um, uh, after the election in May, I was asked to uh, be the convener of the committee. So effectively, my role is, although I'm an SNP MSP, my role is to effectively ensure that the committee runs smoothly, that uh, the agenda, we get through the agenda each meeting and uh, to ensure that all committee members have an opportunity to take part and, and effectively be a neutral chair on the committee although I'm a, I'm a member, obviously, of the SNP. So I, I do that role as well as being also an ordinary member of the committee. I, I, I ask questions and take part in the committee discussions as well. Um, so you have a bit of a dual role on the committee to you know, take part as a normal MSP, but also to ensure that uh, there's, there's parity amongst uh, members and make sure that everything goes smoothly. And what are you actually debating? What, what are you making sure runs smoothly? Well, effectively, there's, there's a variety of things. The committee's... Um, have a number of roles. Uh, one is obviously to scrutinise legislation, whether it be government legislation or even uh, uh, members' bills that come through. So we spend a lot of time looking at legislation, although not, not so much yet. We're just about to start on the National Libraries Bill and then be moving on to, I think, the Children's Rights Bill in the new year. Uh, we also do a lot of subordinate legislation, secondary legislation, uh, the sort of rules and procedures kind of uh, legislation. Um, and then we also carry out kind of inquiries and you know, one-off evidence sessions. So, for example, we, we have uh, groups like uh, the General Teaching Council in to see us. This week, we had uh, Borna Gaelic, who were in talking to us about the, the national plan for Gaelic learning over the next uh, five years. Um, and uh, we're in the middle of the moment of our inquiry into the educational attainment levels of looked-after children. So there's a number of different things we do. So how do you, as a committee, decide then what is right, what goes and what doesn't? Well, the first thing we have to do is obviously make sure that we timetable in all the legislation. That, that has to be done and it all has to be done by a certain date. So all of that is, is effectively booked into the timetable. Uh, beyond that, it's up to the committee itself as to whether it, it, not, it wants to undertake an inquiry and what that will be. Um, and what we do uh, is we have uh, informal meetings. We have a discussion, particularly in the early days of the committee and over the summer recess after the election. We got together, we had a number of subjects, we had some speakers, uh, we had the cabinet secretaries for both culture and for education in to see us. Uh, and after that, we have a, has a wide ranging kind of debate and discussion about what the kind of things we think are important and interest us. Um, and then we eventually narrow it down to particular subjects we want to look at. I mean, obviously we're driven by uh, much of the events going on in education and culture as well. So for example, McCormack review into, into teachers uh, conditions of service, uh, also the Donaldson review, and there's a whole raft of different reviews and reports and consultations going on, and we often um, bring people in to try and give us evidence on those and bring us up to speed on those as well. What about disability issues then? Are you involved in, in looking at them as well and, uh, and with regard to education and culture? Well, we, we certainly are. I mean, for example, I mean, the, the uh, Additional Supports for Learning Bill um, went through the previous uh, Education Committee um, and some of the evidence we've taken this year on, for example, the budget, when we were looking at the budget, was its impact on uh, disabled learners, uh, learners who had particular disabilities um, and adults with particular problems. And I think uh, that was a very important line of questioning from uh, one or two of our members because clearly there is concern about where there are budget cuts um, where there are problems in the budget, uh, that these uh, cuts don't disproportionately affect those who have a disability. Um, and clearly there are concerns that sometimes that's seen as the easy target, that those are the ones who suffer first. Um, and it was very much a concern in the committee that that wasn't happening. And, I, and, and in particular, it was about the fact that uh, uh, college budgets, for example, are under a lot of strain this year, and the committee was very concerned about that. And there had been some evidence to the committee that... Um, uh, adults with a learning disability may be adversely affected by these cuts more so than other, other adults. And I think that was something that the committee took a great deal of interest in. What about culture then? How does that fit into what you do, dealing with culture? What aspects of it? Well, all aspects of it, really. I mean, the, <laughs> everything that effectively the committee is responsible, its remit, if you like, is everything that falls under the, uh, the responsibility of the Cabinet Secretary for Education and uh, uh, Lifelong Learning. That's Mike Russell. And all of the, the stuff that Fiona Hislop deals with as Cabinet Secretary 
for uh, culture and external, external affairs, but we do the culture bit. The external affairs is part of another committee's rebit. So it can be, for example, we had uh, the head of Creative Scotland in to see us to talk about the work that, uh, that they're doing on its first anniversary. Um, we are at the moment uh, in private discussing uh, possible future uh, inquiries after we've finished this one and also what do we want in, in terms of one-off sessions and perhaps roundtable discussions. And some of the subjects that have been, been proposed, although not yet agreed, um, are in areas, for example, of uh, youth music, the creative industries, uh, public service broadcasting, uh, and a number of other areas like that. So we, we take a, a great deal of interest in that. And also, exa for example, we will look at the, um, the national companies when they bring forward their annual reports, such as Scottish Opera, uh, the National Theatre, etc. So we look at them, uh, and also we look at the general well-being of culture, whether it be newspapers, media, or, or the arts more generally in Scotland. Because there was a report done at the University of Scotland recently which was talking about print media and the way it reported disability stories and there had been a definite trend in the last four or five years where the stories had become more negative and it was about benefit cheats and frauds and that was the kind of stories you were getting. Can you have anything to do with that with the way that disabled people are actually perceived uh, in the general media? Can you, can you have any kind of impact on that? Well, I think one of the important things that committees in general do is, is raise the profile of issues. And that certainly can be something that, uh, for example, the Education Committee can do. We've had a number of um, requests and uh, correspondence into the committee and into myself as convener asking us to raise particular issues. Now, obviously, we can't raise all of those issues. Uh, we don't have enough time. But what we do try and do is incorporate them into the work programme. So there are, there are groups, for example, who are concerned about the way that um, teacher training um, is going. Uh, they think that um, some subjects are being missed out uh, in teacher training. So what we don't want to do is, think, is look at that as an individual subject. But I think what we would do is look at that in the wider um, context of, for example, McCormack review into teachers' conditions of service and also curriculum for excellence and how, uh, and how that fits into uh, the, wider, uh, the wider landscape of education. So quite often what happens is we get um, uh, correspondence in asking us to take a subject up and we try and incorporate that into the work that we're doing. So, for example, disability issues in education would be a, would be a clear example of that, where if we got correspondence and that and asking for us to take it up, um, we would try and incorporate that into the work programme as best we could and try and get it to fit in uh, with what we are doing, because it can be quite often quite difficult to actually focus on a single subject on its own like that when it's a very narrow subject. We try to fit it into the wider context. You're listening to the RNIB's Insight Radio. I am uh, sitting with Stuart Maxwell, MSP, Convener of the Education and uh, Culture Committee, giving us a flavour of what is, uh, life is like in the Scottish Parliament. We'll chat more with Stuart after Carol Emerald to the RNIB's Insight Radio, broadcasting live from the Scottish Parliament. And uh, Stuart Maxwell, MSP, joins me now. Now, you were the architect behind the uh, banning of smoking in public places, weren't you? I was, yes. Yeah. Are you a popular man, do you think? Um, I think I probably am now, but I think at the time, um, many people, in fact, the universal opinion almost was that, that this was a... a, a effectively at the end of my political career. Most people thought that uh, by bringing up the idea that you should ban smoking in public places, effectively, it was so unpopular you couldn't possibly get re-elected. Re I mean, the, the, the crazy thing was that in here, you have to get, at that time, you had to get 11 members to sign the bill, including yourself, to take it forward as a, as a member's private bill. Um, and I couldn't get another 10 members to sign it out of the other 128 members. It took me months, and many deals were struck um, to effectively get 10 other members to sign that bill. Uh, and yet, within the space of two years, from the point of being right on the far reaches of you know, what people thought was a, a good idea, uh, it became mainstream. And what uh, were the objectives of the, of the ban? The objectives, well, there were a number of objectives, but the primary one was effectively um, to uh, prevent damage from secondhand smoke on uh, non-smokers uh, in, for example, a pub, whether you were a customer, but particularly if you were a, a member of the bar staff, um, there were a, a number of pieces of medical research which showed that bar staff had the same levels of cotinine in their blood, which shows the, the, the amount of smoke that you inhale, um, uh, as smokers, even though they were non-smokers. So they were, in fact, inhaling as much smoke in a shift at work uh, as if they were a normal smoker. Uh, and clearly, in terms of your ability to go to your work and not be harmed at your work, there was a strong argument there that they had a right to breathe clean air. And you feel you've, you've, you've accomplished something with that? 
quite I, proud I think, of that, do you think? I think well, I think you know, if I do nothing else in my career, and I hope I do, um, that would be something I think I would always call a highlight. Um, uh, I think many people think that was probably the, the most important piece of legislation that the Parliament passed in the first 10 years. It's had a huge impact. And everywhere you go now, people think it's fantastic. They, they love the fact that they can go out for an evening and don't get okay, covered in the smell of smoke. Um, I think places are healthier, healthier now. Bar staff, I think, are healthier as well as you know other restaurant staff, etc. And I think it's a nicer atmosphere for us, for tourists, for everybody to go into their pubs and restaurants now that there's no longer smoking. And I think most people now think it's absolutely crazy, the mere idea that you were allowed to smoke in these places in the first place. I think people have settled into the, to the new regime very, very quickly and very easily, and I think it's very popular now. Certainly a major change to uh, socialising in Scotland. You're listening to the RNIB's Insight Radio. Stuart Maxwell, MSP, thank you very much for joining us here. It's great to be on. Thanks you.